Hearing is the ability to perceive sounds by transducing sound vibrations, which is a mechanical stimulus, waves, very much like waves in the ocean or waves in a puddle. So the ear transduces those sound vibrations, that mechanical stimulus, to the ear and converts that into an electrical signal that the brain can understand. Pretty amazing, right? We'll talk briefly about how that happens. But not only does the ear receive the sound wave vibrations, but it also has receptors for equilibrium that helps you to maintain your balance and your orientation in the world around you. So the ear is going to be divided into three different areas. We'll look briefly at those. So the ear has an external part that easily enough we call the external ear. So of course here if you look at the legend it is color coding so you can see what's going on. So all of the yellow part here is external ear, the blue is middle ear, and the deeper pink area is the inner ear. So let's begin here with the outer ear. The part that you see is the auricle, also called the pina, P-I-N-N-A. So this is the ear lobe where you often will wear your earrings. And the upper curved part is the helix. So these two areas together make up the auricle, oops, sorry about that, the auricle, also called the pina. Now, coming in, we have a canal or a passageway. So from the uh, outer part of the auricle or the pina, there is a passageway called the external auditory canal. So the auricle serves as a funnel to bring sound waves into the external auditory canal, which is a passageway that opens into the temporal bone. So remember when you learned bones, you learned the temporal bone, which was located just above the ear. So this bony structure here is temporal, this is temporal, and all of this is temporal. So much of the ear is located within the temporal bone. Okay, so the external auditory canal is here, and that is going to funnel sound waves into this little drum-like stu structure that we commonly call the eardrum, but that is the tympanum. You have modified sweat glands in the external auditory canal that are going to secrete what we commonly call earwax. That's cerumen. Now, sound waves come in. They bounce or vibrate against that tympanum, the eardrum, and then those sound waves are going to be transmitted into the middle part of the ear. So the middle ear is made up of three bony structures called ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and those are in order from the tympanum. So the malleus vibrates because the tympanum vibrated. When the malleus vibrates, it vibrates the incus, which then in turn vibrates the stapes. The stapes, which looks like a stirrup, is sitting in a little open area we call the oval window that opens into the inner ear. So all of this curly structure is part of the inner ear. The inner ear is divided into a couple of different areas. The cochlea, which looks very much like a snail, and that is going to be responsible for our sense of hearing and the semicircular canals, which are going to process equilibrium or balance. Another thing you can also see here, you have parts of cranial nerves, the cochlear nerve and the vestibular nerve, which together are sometimes referred to as the vestibulocochlear nerve. Okay, so this is going to be the passageway to and from the brain where information goes in to uh, into the brain for processing. And then one last thing you can see here is this long tubular structure that runs from the middle ear down through the temporal bone to the nasopharynx. So that is the posterior part of the nasal cavity that opens down into the throat. You'll hear that referred to as the auditory tube 
or sometimes more commonly the eustachian tube, and even more uncommonly the pharyngeotympanic tube. So from the tympanum to the pharynx, pharyngeotympanic. Anyway, we'll talk about that uh, when we move on in a little bit more. We just wanted to get a brief overview of those structures and where they're located. So make sure that you know the structures that make up the external, internal, and middle part of the ear. We'll learn about some of their functions in just a few minutes. Okay, so we looked at the picture of all the different structures. Let's talk just a little bit uh, again about what some of these different areas of the ear are doing. So we'll begin with the external ear and the auricle or the pina is that cartilaginous or elastic cartilaginous flap that funnels sound into the external auditory canal to the tympanic membrane which we commonly call of course the eardrum. A torn tympanic membrane may be due to overuse of q-tips, pushing them in too far, or perhaps someone bumps your elbow while you're cleaning your ears. That's why you shouldn't put it inside your ear canal, just around the outer part to dry it. Uh, torn tympanic membranes may also be the result of an accident or trauma. Very rarely, even though you think it might occur more often, uh, bugs get into the ear canal, but they typically usually they typically don't get far enough down or large enough or active enough to damage the tympanic membrane. Uh, but sometimes infections can cause uh, a lot of inflammation, which makes that that eardrum much easier to tear. These usually will heal the, their selves. Uh, these tears will in about one month. However, some children are very prone to uh, chronic ear infections because of the way the tympanic membrane, or I'm sorry, because of the way the eustachian tube in the children is more horizontal, and that allows the fluid to build up in that uh, in that middle ear and cause more infections. We'll look more at that at the end of the um, at the end of this section. Uh, you can view that tympanic membrane, of course, with uh, an otoscope. Oto means ear. Scope to view. So these are the little, um, the little pieces of equipment that the doctor uses when he puts the little funnel into your ear and shines the light in. That gives him the ability to look at the tympanic membrane and look for any signs of inflammation or any type of damage. In that external auditory canal, we have modified sweat glands that secrete earwax. So those are ceruminous glands. Uh, the earwax is very thick and sticky and it's there to provide somewhat of a waterproof protection uh, for the ear canal, but also uh, it helps to keep things out of the ear that shouldn't be in there. Have you ever wondered why you have hair in your ears? Same reason you have hair in your nose. It's a protective mechanism to keep things from getting in. So if pieces of fuzz or small little bugs or You've all heard spiders crawl in your ears at night. I don't know how true that is, but anything that gets into the ear has the potential to get trapped on the hairs and also in that thick, sticky cerumen so that it can't get into the deeper areas of the ear and cause problems. That cerumen, though, can become impacted, especially uh, if you do use a lot of Q-tips or put things into your ears to scratch your ear canal a lot. And once those... Um, external auditory canals become impacted, that built up cerumen in there can block the passage of sound waves and that can lead to something called conduction deafness. The middle ear is an air-filled cavity within the temporal bone and it contains the three ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, which are the smallest bones in the human body. There's also a very, very small muscle attached to some of those bones in there that is the smallest muscle in the body as well. So uh, sound vibrations are transmitted from the external auditory canal to the tympanic membrane and again when that tympanic membrane vibrates it's going to vibrate the ossicles. Those ossicles uh, in order are the malleus that attaches to or touches the tympanic membrane the incus, which touches the malleus, 
and the stapes, which is the last of the ossicles, that sits in an opening called the oval window uh, that leads into or is the opening to the middle ear. The anterior wall of the middle ear contains an opening, as we saw a few minutes ago, uh, the opening of the auditory canal, also called the eustachian canal, also called the pharyngeotympanic canal. So that is a connection between the middle ear to the pharynx. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, that allows for fluid and air to pass through that tube. Now it's normally closed, but it opens when we yawn or when we swallow, and this allows air pressure to leave the middle ear cavity and to, equal, to equalize the pressure within the ear. So when your ear pops, that's changes in pressure as air is moving from one area to another within that um, auditory tube. So the auditory tube is also a route for pathogens to get into the middle ear. So from the nasopharynx, pathogens, bacteria, uh, different types of things that can cause you to develop infections have a route to get into the middle ear and that leads to ear infections such as otitis media. Ot, of course, ear, uh, media, middle, so middle ear infections. When we looked at the middle ear, remember, those sound waves were coming from the tympanic membrane and vibrating the ossicles. And that stapes, the last of the three ossicles, was sitting in an opening called the oval window that opens into the inner ear. The inner ear is sometimes called a labyrinth. Labyrinth means maze. So this is very, very highly coiled, twisted structures uh, that make up the inner ear. A part of the inner ear is going to be associated with balance and equilibrium, and that is going to be all of these semicircular canals and a part of this very first area that we call the vestibule or the entryway. This part, the very spiral-looking cochlea, is where sound is going to be processed. So, so far we've been talking about sound waves, vibrations coming in and causing things, causing structures to vibrate and that wave of vibration is being passed through the ear. We're getting very close to turning that into an electrical signal. So the processing of sound is going to be summarized in the table that will follow, but before we look at the nerve process and how uh, mechanical vibrations become electrical activities that our brain can then process as sound, let's look very briefly at equilibrium. There are two forms of equilibrium or balance in the human body. Static equilibrium helps us to maintain posture or balance when the body is not moving, but it's static equilibrium that can tell us if our head is upside down in the world around us or if we're sitting in a car, the body is not moving, but our environment, the car, is moving. So static equilibrium helps us to maintain uh, that balance when uh, we are thinking about the forces of gravity around us. Dynamic equilibrium in turn or interprets balance when the body is moving or the head is moving. So it helps you to know uh, when you have balance or when the body's moving. Uh, for example, when you turn your head or when you're walking, your dynamic equilibrium helps to keep you in an upright position. So the organs um, that house the receptors for equilibrium are called the vestibular apparatus. So remember the vestibule is the opening into the, not the actual hole, but the area, once those sound waves, that, that vibration goes through the inner window, that entryway, the open area, is called the vestibule. Very much like if you uh, have been into a church or any type of similar building, when you walk in the door before you walk into the main part of the church, there's a sort of an entryway there. That is also called a vestibule. 
So the vestibular vestibule apparatus is that entryway into the inner ear where the receptors for the uh, organs of equilibrium are located. So the vestibular apparatus contains two chambers called the utricle and the saccule and the semicircular canals. The utricle and the saccule have thick layers of rocks called otoliths that are made of calcium carbonate that cover their surface. There is a lot to maintaining equilibrium, so we're just going to take what little bit we've looked at so far and tie that into the role of these otoliths or the rocks in your ears. So the otoliths are little crystals that are going to lie on top of the membranes that line the saccule and the utricles. And when these rocks, now remember they're in a very fluidy, liquidy environment of that membrane, and when that liquid moves in response to a stimulus, those otoliths move as well, and it causes a bending or a, a moving of the hair cells that are underneath it. Now, I'm not talking about hair like the hair on your head or the hair on your arms. These are hair cells, which means they're just very, very thin cells that move much like hairs. So when the otoliths move, then they are pushing on those hair cells and that deformation or deforming of those cells causes those receptors underneath to depolarize. This depolarization then uh, is going to, the receptors that depolarize are going to synapse with sensory neurons of the vestibulocochlear nerve that then will take that information into the brain. Now, that is very, very, very simplistic. It's a lot more complicated than that. But just sort of get an idea of what's going on and the role of uh, these otoliths in moving those hair cells and helping the body to detect that movement has occurred. Something that many of us have experienced related to equilibrium is called motion sickness. So that's a condition that results when there's conflict between the senses with regard to the way that you're moving, in regard to your motion. For example, the vestibular apparatus may sense uh, an angular or a vertical motion, while the eyes and your proprio or balance receptors in your muscles and joints determine the position of the body in space. So they're processing two different things. So for instance, if you're on a boat, your vestibular apparatus informs the brain that there's movement from the waves but your eyes don't see the movement when you're looking at the boat, when you're looking at the floor or the walls of the boat, right? So this leads to conflict between the senses. Your eyes are processing one thing, your proprioceptors are processing another. So motion sickness can be experienced in many different situations that involve movement. Uh, some people get motion sickness riding in a car or a plane or a train or any type of vehicle. Many others get it because of the very rapid movements of amusement park rides. So symptoms of motion sickness can include nausea, headache, your mouth waters, you start to sweat, uh, start to turn pale, you may feel like you're going to faint. Usually though, once the motion has stopped, the symptoms will disappear. If it's not possible to stop the motion, sometimes it's helpful if you sit in the front of the car or toward the front of the train. Uh, on the upper deck of the boat, so you're looking out at the horizon and not looking uh, at the moving very near you to the sides. Uh, not reading helps, so anything that keeps you focused far away is going to help to decrease that confusion between the senses. There are also medications for motion sickness that uh, most often have to be taken in advance of your travel or of your anticipated movement. Uh, and these include scopolamine or what we commonly call Dramamine. And these can come in patches that you put on your body. So that tells you they're transdermal. They diffuse across the skin or also in tablets that you may take. And hopefully you've not experienced vertigo or the dizziness, a sensation of spinning or movement where the world just seems to be revolving around you or you may seem to be revolving in the world around you. Uh, very often this is associated with nausea and in a lot of cases vomiting as well. 
One of the more common causes of this are infections of the vestibular apparatus or some types of arthritis that uh, result in inflammation of the neck that can cause stimulation of those, um, of those receptors to be detecting movement when they shouldn't be detecting movement. So they're just receiving stimulus uh, because of the pressure and because of the inflammation, but not necessarily because of the body moving. So the next two slides give you just a summary of the structures of the ear and the functions of those structures. So the external ear, what the external ear is made of, the auricles, the external auditory canal, and the tympanic membrane, and how they function in hearing. Uh, next we have the middle ear, which of course includes the auditory ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and what they're doing to transmit and amplify those vibrations from the eardrum, the tympanic membrane, to the oval window, and the role of the auditory tube helping to equalize that pressure. And then finally we have a brief look at the structures of the inner ear, including the cochlea, which is going to process the sense of hearing. So it contains a series of channels and fluids and membranes that transmit those vibrations uh, deeper into the cochlea, into the organ of cordy, which is the organ of hearing. It also contains hair cells um, that produce receptor potentials or action potentials, and that is going to in turn elicit nerve impulses in the cochlear branch of that vestibulocochlear nerve that we saw in the image while ago leading out to the brain. The vestibular apparatus includes those semicircular ducts and the utricle, I don't know why I can't say that word some days, and the saccule. Uh, both the utricle and the saccule are called otolithic organs because of those otoliths, the little crystals that stimulate the receptors within them. And of course, that in turn is going to send action potentials along that vestibulocochlear nerve as well. Uh, remember, all of this is going through that vestibulocochlear nerve into the brain. So the sense of hearing is detected through the structures in the ear. And then those nerve impulses travel through the vestibulocochlear nerve to the brain where we determine what those sounds are. And we make sense of those in auditory association areas. The semicircular canals and, uh, and the utricles and the saccule are the structures that we talked about that help us to maintain our equilibrium uh, as those waves are transmitted through and cause fluids to move inside those structures and then of course cause those uh, otoliths to move as well. That in turn stimulates those hair cells which depolarize the nerve pathway leading back into the brain again.